I wanted to start off basically by saying that this meeting's purpose is to educate our chamber membership about what's going on in the legislature. Obviously, that's an important thing because what happens there affects us directly, uh, eventually. And uh, there's a lot of important work that goes on there. And so what better way to find out about it than from the legislators themselves? We are really thankful to have these four gentlemen here with us today, and we look forward to, to hearing their remarks about what just happened in the legislature and what may be about to happen as we go back into a, a, another session, which we hope will be pretty short, but we'll see. All right, I'll start off with uh, introducing our first speaker. That would be Senator Frank Ruff. Frank Ruff was elected to serve. Are y'all laughing at me already? <laughs> yeah. Well, we could change the order. <laughs> Oh, me. Uh, he was elected to serve the Virginia Senate in November of 2000 to fill an unexpired term of the late Richard Holland. Prior to Frank's election to the Virginia Senate, he served in the Virginia House of Delegates, and he was first elected there in 1993. After the 2011 redistricting, the 15th district includes all of the counties all of the counties of Charlotte, Lunenburg, Mecklenburg, and Nottoway, as well, of, as well as parts of the counties of Brunswick, Campbell, Dinwiddie, Halifax, Pennsylvania, Prince George, and part of the city of Danville. So he is certainly covering a, a wide spectrum there. Let's give a warm welcome to Senator Frank Ruff. The, uh, the reason we were laughing was because Bill and I realized that neither one of us had any prepared remarks. And those guys do. We figured we'd be last and we could just kind of, they would remind us what would happen during the session. Uh, the, the, when I leave Richmond on Saturday night, uh, I try to forget what happened. And, and these eight, ten days of... I've forgotten most of it, so I really don't know what happened. So I'm counting on hearing something interesting. Yeah, let me borrow your notes. <laughs> the, uh, I, I, it, part of the things that, uh, just kind of an overall thing. Uh, rural Virginia, I think, lost. We lost a lot, uh, which is not, which as the time that I've been in Richmond, I've found that we uh, spend more time playing defense a lot of times than we do offense because of the fact that Northern Virginia has grown so much in the suburbs of Tidewater and, and uh, Richmond. So it puts us at a disadvantage. Um, things that for years had been commonplace of defeating Sunday hunting, uh, we, we, it was just normal. That wasn't getting anywhere. This year it passed overwhelmingly. Uh, they attacked our fox pens again. Uh, the uh, the, the, uh, but a lot of the issues just don't relate to us at all. They had a little problem in the suburb counties, suburban counties of uh, Northern Virginia about the right to farm. Uh, and whether, anybody, whether the local government was infringing on local businesses, that's not an issue down here. Down here we know how to get along with each other, but it got through. Um, we, had, uh, we had folks who wanted to raise the minimum wage, and uh, they made a great fight for that. Um, the way you raise wages is by training people to have more knowledge, to have more skills, not pretending like that you're helping them. Because when you raise the minimum wage, that means that everything goes up and creates more inflation, which means they got nowhere. Everybody else just kind of stays in place. Um, so those are the type of things that 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 have concerned me is, is where we're going. If you look at what we do in government, a lot of times we screw it up pretty royally. Uh, and, and starting in Washington, and I don't need to say anymore, but anybody who has been touched in any way by the Affordable Care Act knows that it is a tar baby that you will be burnt with. Doesn't matter who you are. I think the physicians were very supportive of that when it went through. Now they're realizing that the providers are getting cut in Medicare and things like that. I think the hospital association nationally, 
uh, was supportive of it because they thought they were going to get what they wanted. Um, everybody gets burned. I talked to a, a nurse practitioner who works in Lawrenceville, and she was just delighted that she had people that were able to come in and get free mammograms. And she was a little concerned about the lady because she had her, her she had gone on the health care exchange and she pays $28 a month for her health care. Only problem is she has an $8,000 deductible. So she gets the free mammogram, she finds out she has breast cancer, <coughs> and then where is she going to get the $8,000? So I'm not sure that, we're, that that lady was any better off. So we've got problems that we have to deal with. Um, and, and where this session goes next week with the budget, our hope is that we will separate the budget from Medicaid so that we can do the things that we need to do so local government and businesses can go about their part, uh, what they're doing is professionally and orderly as possible. The issue of the Medicaid expansion, we'll worry about that, and, and that will be dealt with. There'll be some kind of resolution on that, but I don't think the two need to be, or have to be tied together. I said the government screws things up. You know, I, I really meant that. Um, we have been concerned about workforce training for a long time. I remember back uh, when Whit Clement was still in the House, uh, we tried to work on some things with the community college to make the system work for the non-credit courses better, the courses that teach the skills that employ people. And we thought we made a little progress, but we didn't make any progress. So what is it now, 15 years later, uh, the chancellor was over at the com uh, community college, and it was a listening tour, I think he called it. And at the end of that, I said, we have to do something to equalize the non-credit courses with the full credit courses, the degree-seeking courses. And he explained to me his view, and that is people do what they get paid to do. The college presidents and colleges are, get paid for those full credit classes, so they want everything to be full credit. They do a great job on those programs they do for credit. But are they doing as great a job as they can? I would tell you no. No offense to them, but they take welding, for example. Most of the community colleges want that welder to have an associate's degree. That's a two-year program. Three, two or three decades ago, when we were talking about the community colleges being the source of beginning education for 18-year-olds who are still living at home is close enough to drive. That made sense. But when you talk about today's student, which may be a displaced worker who, for no fault of their own, needs to go back and get training for something, and he's got a wife and two kids, he may be on unemployment for a while, but he sees that two-year program, and he is either not going to enter it or he's going to enter it until he gets a job, and then he's going to drop out and have wasted the time and money and the energy involved. That's not a winning solution. So this year I had to, uh, the, the chancellor and I finally figured out a way to do it, but we were a little bit behind the curve of the governor's budget and didn't get it in the budget. But that was to incentivize the community college to $1,000 per student for a skill that had an independent certification that uh, for each one of those certifications that, that was needed in an area. So well, taking Weldon, for example, if the program at John Tyler Community College teaches about uh, 20, gets about 23 hours credit for lab work, for working actually with the machine. It comes to somewhere around 70 hours over a two-year period. You take that individual and you put him in a lab six or eight hours a day, and you can teach him how to be a, a good welder in less than a month. He 
tries it. Then he can go get tested for certification. If he fails, he can come back and take another week or so. Then he can make good money for his family. The, uh, but, but in Richmond, and Danny had the same bill. And uh, they, we got mine through the Senate with no problem. And Danny, <laughs> Danny they, they, they decided they would carry his over. And uh, so we went over to the House, and the, the uh, higher ed subcommittee chairman said, well, you know this bill is not going to make it through. And he got that word to me twice. So I said, okay. And so we wrote an editorial, an op-ed for the Richmond Times-Dispatch, and got the chancellor to co-sign it with me. So we went before his subcommittee. and. Uh, Lo and behold, it came out of that subcommittee seven to one with the chairman on one vote against it. And he said he supported it, but he just had to do that because somebody had told him to do that. <laughs> so in the full committee, uh, the, it went out of there 20 to one. And the chairman of the subcommittee voted for it, but the chairman of the committee voted against it because somebody told him to. So it went up to House Appropriation and. Uh, they killed that sucker. Um, <laughs> but, but there's still hope in there and that because the Senate put $2 million in the proposal and the House put zero, so hopefully we can come to, the, come to some kind of uh, test pilot of, uh, of trying it and proving it. Because if you, can, if you can help just a few folks and you can prove that it works, then let's do it. it we don't need to talk about workforce. We need to do something about it. We need to help those folks who have worked hard in their earlier lives and have been displaced. And if we don't have that, we don't give an opportunity. Uh, there aren't any in-between jobs now. You've got the choice between fast food and, and skilled work. And I vote and I will continue to work for those skilled jobs so that we can get those people back and raising families and doing being part of the community as they're supposed to. Thank y'all. We appreciate your comments, Senator Robb, very thoughtful comments. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from Senator Bill Stanley. Bill Stanley was elected to serve the 19th district in the Virginia, Virginia Senate in a special election in January of 2011 to fill the seat vacated by Robert Hurt upon his election to the U.S. House of Representatives. After the 2011 redistricting, he moved into the 20th Senate District, which includes the cities of Galax, Martinsville, and Danville, all of the counties of Halifax, Henry, and Patrick, and part of the counties of Carroll, Franklin, and Pennsylvania. Let's give a warm welcome to Senator Bill Stanley. Thank you, it's always a great opportunity to, to come here after session and speak with you all about what we did up in Richmond. A lot of times when we're in Richmond, it's kind of like a bubble. Uh, you have to escape the jurisdiction in order to, to feel human again. Uh, the pace is, of course, in the biennial process, a 60-day session. Uh, we in the Senate, knowing that Marketplace Virginia and or Medicaid expansion was going to be uh, uh, put onto our budget, we voted for, um, most of us voted for, an extension of the session so that we would have stayed there and worked out the issues and the problems. Uh, the Democrats in the, in the Senate, the resolution came over from the House. Uh, Republicans voted for it. Democrats voted against it. They wanted to adjourn sine die and come back in a special session. Why is that important? Well, I think because as I look out and I see many of our local leaders, uh, there is a look of apprehension on their face. It's either because I'm standing here and talking <laughs> or I'm telling them what they probably already know. When we adjourned what we call in the Senate sine die, in the House they call it sine die, uh, we think sine die is a much more southern term than they think it's a Latin term. But when you adjourn, and when you adjourn on the, the front end of a biennial year, when we plan our two-year budgets, we adjourn without a budget. As you all have known, we adjourned without a budget. And one could think uh, that, well, there's a budget floating out there. No, we have to start the whole process over again. So when we go back next week, Governor uh, McAuliffe has to hand down a budget from the governor's mansion. We are told that it will include some of the things that uh, former Governor McDonald put in his budget, 
but that it will also include other things, which then starts the whole process over. It comes to our chambers, we refer it to our committees, our committees will now have to put the same amendments on it that we did before. We may lay our old budget on top of it and send it out. And then once that's done, uh, they send over to their budget, we send our budget over to the House and they promptly kill it. Uh, which they do every year. So our budget has a shelf life only to the point where it gets to appropriations and then they put their budget on top of ours. It's a three day to four day process, but we also have issues with regard to what amendments might be made from the governor's budget. So it starts the whole process over. Now we anticipate, and, and I must apologize for those that, uh, that saw the Senate, we had, uh, when it came to Medicaid expansion, we had three of our Republican senators in, the, in my caucus put down what was called Marketplace Virginia. Now, if you'll just bear with me, I want to explain some of the things that why we as Republicans, why everyone who's uh, sitting here today are opposed to Medicaid expansion and certainly even Marketplace Virginia. The first thing that I think we always have to consider is the cost to the state. And when we look at those, let's look at the arguments that are being made for expansion of Medicaid. And I know the chambers have come out and been in, in support of uh, the expansion of Medicaid. They've also come out the Virginia Chamber and said, uncouple it, take it away from the budget, and then consider it separately. We appreciate that because I think it is a separate issue. But the first thing that we hear is that Virginia will lose $1.7 billion of tax money that the federal government is going to tax each individual taxpayer in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and it's going to go someplace else. And the companion argument is, it's free money, we should take it. Well, there's no such thing as free money, especially when it comes from a federal government that is $17, $18 trillion in debt. You can add almost $10 more trillion dollars by the full implementation of the Affordable Health Care Act. And what we have is instead of that $1.7 billion, $1.2 billion never leaves Virginia or it comes back. And that is in the form of the subsidies. What we're talking about in way of educating ourselves um, just on Medicaid expansion, <coughs> Medicaid covers 100% above the poverty line. Obamacare, for lack of a better term, covers down to 138% above the poverty line. So we have from 101 to 138, we have this coverage gap, it's known. Well, they say we want the 1.7 billion to close the coverage gap. But that 1.7 billion, 1.2 billion comes back, as I've just said, in the form of subsidies. That is, for those at the 138 and above. And it doesn't come back to the state government, it comes back to the, to the Virginians' pocket as a subsidy to offset the cost of the premiums from what they call the bronze all the way to the gold plant. So that leaves about half a billion dollars in terms of expansion. So when you hear free money and it's going away and not coming back, $1.2 billion comes back into the economy of Virginia, not through the government, but through the people. The second thing is, is that the government plans to fund this if it approves Marketplace Virginia. We'll talk about those differences in just a second. They plan on uh, financing 100% of the coverage to fill that gap for three years. But after three years, they say, well, 90% for the next two years. What we have right now in Medicaid coverage in Virginia is we have a 50-50 split with the federal government. We pay 50 cents, they pay 50 cents for every dollar that goes into Medicaid. Uh, right now, that's an, over a $9 billion program. Four and a half and change comes from the federal government. Uh, four and a half comes from the state. Now, if they are to dial this back because you know that the federal government cannot, cannot sustain 100% coverage or even 90% coverage for those participating states for a five-year deal, then what we have to, as legislators, look at is what happens to a program already which grows at a rate of 8% per year. That's average, just even most recently. So if, we, if we're on the hook for $4.5 billion, and I'm no math guy, but in three years, that's another billion dollars that Virginia has to find just on normal growth without expansion to cover Medicaid. If you get into the situation where we accept the Medicaid expansion and the federal government says, oh, hey, we can't handle it, and you know they will, we're going to go back to our normal ratios. We're talking about another billion dollars. Where do we find two billion dollars per year? Well, there are only three places. One is from taking away services to localities. One is reducing the education numbers for public education and secondary education. One is reducing money across the board for, uh, for public safety, putting people at risk uh, by not being able to pay our sheriffs and our state troopers. Or the most profound way, which in Richmond they love to do, which is to take it from your wallet, to take it from businesses, to put it on the backs of the taxpayer. A $2 billion hole in the state budget 
And with revenues being generated as they are, we're not going to have, even in a robust economy, uh, closing that gap. So that's where we are right now. And Medi Marketplace Virginia is just Medicaid expansion by another name. It's a demonstration program that, that some Republican senators came up with with the idea that they would do it in a private managed health care system. Of course, the private managed health care system is still the same management uh, team that does Medicaid. However, what they were offering to do is pay the Medicaid right plus 40 percent. So the hospitals would certainly benefit. And why would the hospitals benefit? I think Frank touched on it briefly, which is this. Obamacare reduces the amount that is paid from the federal government to our hospitals and healthcare systems for Medicare, for seniors. It's one of the kind of known but not really said a lot about. And in that reduction, they have to make up those revenues somehow, and the hospital associations are asking us to make them up through the expansion of Medicaid or Marketplace Virginia. I think that it is not fiscally sound nor responsible policy for the Commonwealth of Virginia to do something that may blow a $2 billion hole in our budget. And I, and I cannot support something like that, because what we're doing is we're kicking the can down the road, as they like to say, uh, for our future generations to pay. There must be a comprehensive solution. I don't think that you put a feel-good Band-Aid called Marketplace Virginia or Medicaid expansion with the hope that it might create some jobs, but quite frankly, create an extra burden on the taxpayer and on the Commonwealth of Virginia. I think there are comprehensive solutions that we as a state, especially when we have skin in the game to the tune of four or five billion dollars in one industry, can create some common sense reforms that can be used in the healthcare industry to, to bring down the cost of service and increase the efficiency of the delivery of those services. And I think with our healthcare partners, we can find those solutions and come back next year with a package of legislation that will, that will be, uh, I think, a lot better in terms of saving money for those who pay the premiums and those who seek the services. And also may give us the ability to help the working poor because I think all of us would agree we would love to cover everyone if we could but it is not fiscally responsible looking at what our budget requirements are the next two years and the next five years. And right now, we're asking a budget to be passed because as I look at our members of the localities from the Board of Supervisors and the City Council, you have to get your budgets ready by May. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid to say that I think because our positions have been dug in so soundly, uh, that this may go, this overtime as we're calling it, may go right up to the day of the 1st of July. And that puts a lot of fear in the minds of those who are elected leaders at the local level. And I'm sorry for that. Because quite frankly, we had a budget that we were only, I think, eight, nine, twenty million dollars apart. It was one of the closest we'd ever come to between the House and Senate of uh, reconciliation in terms of that budget. We should have had one. And hopefully uh, cooler heads will prevail and that we can separate Medicaid expansion and the issue of coverage of the working poor in a different manner. That's all I'll say about the budget. Luckily for you, I only wrote my stuff down on a card while I was sitting there, so that means I'll only talk for 30, 35 minutes. Um, but you know, in terms of legislation, it was a tough and different year. had a different feel to it. Um, a lot of legislation that I put out was for to fight poverty by creating opportunities. Not a handout, but a hand up. Uh, and of course, one of those bills that was passed, and I'm waiting on the governor's signature, was creating financial literacy for those that receive public assistance. You cannot force someone on public assistance as a, as a measure and a, a prerequisite of that assistance to do something. Uh, they say that's wrong. But what we have to do is offer those people courses in financial literacy. So what I had was a piece of legislation that, that got the community colleges together with our uh, Virginia Employment Commission so that when someone is uh, qualified for benefits and claims, uh, benefits, that they will be offered a financial literacy course, which they can, through their own volition, choose to take or not take. But what we've taken is a course that's offered, quite frankly, to our children and to their children and try to make it available for adults because that is the one common thread in terms of why people can't break the cycle of poverty is because financial literacy, and especially in a changing uh, money uh, market as it is, financial literacy is one of the core components of learning how to save, learning how to save for a house, learning how to save for college for your kids and, and the like. So that was one bill that, that got through. I, I proposed 28 bills, I think, uh, by the time it went through the buzzsaw that's known as the House of Delegates, I think I got nine out, eight or nine out. Um, I know exactly what Frank means about how great the, your bill is and how everybody loves it and they send it to appropriations, which is this dark room on the ninth floor. And you walk in and there are all these delegates and they're in big leathery chairs, but all you see is this. 
And they're like this. They're looking at each other. They're looking at each other. And you just walk in and go, hi, I'm Senator Stanley. And then you hear motion to carry, motion to lay, uh, lay it gently on the table, and you're out of there in about two minutes. Uh, one bill that actually made it out of there, which I'm pretty proud of, been fighting for three years, and it's a bipartisan bill I've done with Senator George Barker out of uh, Fairfax, was WorkShare. WorkShare is a, is a federal program uh, which the federal government will pay for the startup costs, which actually, when adopted by the states, the 26 states that had it, have saved over 220,000 American jobs. And what it does is it allows a participating company that is contemplating layoffs, that's something we all know about down here in Southside, instead of laying their force off, let's say they had to reduce their workforce by 20%, so they lay off 20% of their workers to capture that money uh, during a downturn in their, their, uh, their economy. What they do is re reduce the hours of the workers, keeping them on the job by 20%. And even though that's a reduction in pay, what Virginia does, it steps in and it makes up a lot of that through VEC. Otherwise, that worker would be getting full benefits for the Virginia Employment Commission. Instead, we, we close that gap a little bit, keep them on the job, keep them working, keep their skills sharp, keep their benefits in place, whether it be health, retirement, and the like. Uh, that's a, a way of trying to make sure that we're in partnership with these businesses that we believe in. Uh, it's a, it's a non-taxable event to the Commonwealth of Virginia. It's only for the participating companies that will eventually pay back what is, in a sense, uh, short-term help. But it keeps people working. So I was really uh, proud of that bill that it actually had died in the, in the House uh, for two years. And for some reason, when I got up to appropriations, <laughs> they let it through. So. <laughs> Uh, so I was very happy about that. And finally, uh, um, one of the bills that I thought was very important, Les, uh, Delegate Adams and I carried a, an I-73 study commission, a two-year study commission. The House killed it, <laughs> they killed his. So we turned it into a Senate. Huh? I'm sorry, carried it over, my, my apologies. That's a difference without a distinction in, a, in, the, in the Senate. But uh, this creates a two-year commission to determine how we build I-73, which I think we can all agree we need uh, an interstate in our area to encourage companies to come here who can move product from here to the ports. So the Senate has created a two-year study commission. Les was a, a patron on the Senate resolution uh, that will take local leaders with the elected officials, and we will sit there in partnership with North Carolina and South Carolina, not talk about I-73, but see how we can build it, get in partnership with the federal government to make that a reality. Because too many times as I walked through, uh, of course, my district, people would say I-73, it's not going to be built in our lifetime. You know, it's a great idea, but it's not going to be built in our lifetime. Well, I wanted to make sure that Virginia, the Commonwealth, focused on I-73 as an important high-priority corridor for our transportation plan in the future. And this uh, commission will report back to the General Assembly in uh, 2015 its findings on how we build it. North Carolina and South Carolina are already very excited uh, about joining in this commission. I've talked to leaders down there because they want to get it done. They're not going to build it if, if we don't show any interest in building it as well. They built parts of it and then stopped. But this would give us a direct line from the south side of Virginia to a deep water port in Charleston, South Carolina. So economically, it makes sense for us to try to do it. So those were some of the things that I did. Um, of course, there's more and I could talk forever, but I won't. But, okay, I will. Give me your opportunity. <laughs> but so that's that's where we stood. It was an interesting year. We're going to go back again, and uh, certainly uh, I think what we like is that we're part-time legislators. We come home, we come home to our families. We have a job, uh, we have a career, so we don't lose focus on what's important for the people of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Where sometimes in Washington D.C., a career politician can, you know, you're up in Washington D.C. too much, and you're not in your district working. That's your job. So uh, it's certainly been an honor to serve you, and uh, I hope to in the future. Uh, but that's my report, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. Thank you so much for those thoughtful comments. We really appreciate that, Senator Stanley. Now we're going to hear from Delegate Danny Marshall. Danny Marshall was first elected to serve in the Virginia House of Delegates in 2002. Danny represents the 14th District, which includes all of the city of Danville and part of Henry and Pennsylvania counties. Let's give a warm welcome to Delegate Marshall. Good morning. You know, first of all, I'd like to recognize my former seatmate, uh, Delegate Don Merricks. Uh, Don, please stand up. Don is, uh, Don got it. Uh, you know, he's uh, one of the good guys there in the General Assembly, and we really miss him. Uh, my uh, first six years, uh, Robert Hertz sat next to me, and he left. Then Don sat next to me for six years, and he left. 
Uh, Les had more sense. He didn't sit next to me uh, for the past uh, four years. So, uh, so Don, uh, Don has always got a smile on his face now since he's left the General Assembly, and he's two inches taller. So, Don, thank you for your service. Uh, let's, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, something that uh, is uh, near and dear to our hearts here. And uh, just watching uh, CBS National News last night, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, they did a segment uh, on the Dan River. And go back on, look, on, on YouTube and look at that. Uh, it was very, very well done. And I think, Mayor, that tonight at uh, 530 uh, at the uh, uh, Council Chambers, uh, Department of Environmental Quality uh, will be there to uh, give an update. Well, back while we were in session, the second Monday uh, after the spill, and then March 6, which was right after, uh, right before we uh, left, uh, I asked the McCulloch administration to come in and give us an update uh, on uh, on Dan River. And uh, at uh, at that uh, meeting were uh, Senator Stanley Ruff, Congressman Cosgrove from Virginia Beach, Delegate Adams, Edmonds from over in Halifax, and Delegate Wright from Clarksville. Basically, everybody from here uh, to the east. And from the McCulloch administration was the Secretary of Natural Resources, Molly Ward, the Secretary of Health, Bill Hazel, the Attorney General's Office, uh, John Daniels, uh, John uh, Albach, who is di uh, Director of uh, Drinking Water, David Paylor, Director of Department of Environmental Quality, and Bob Duncan, who is Director of Game and Inland Fisheries, and plus there were some other ones there. And so what we, uh, I asked uh, for this meeting to go forward is I wanted to make sure that the, uh, the administration uh, knew our importance of Dan River. And let me just give you a little information. And if you want to see any of these, uh, you know, uh, uh, updates, you can go to my website, dannymarshall.com, and uh, all of this information is on there. But uh, Secretary Ward, uh, who is really in the forefront, uh, and I think that she's been to Danville a couple of times, but one of the things that uh, she has said is that she wants to make sure that uh, we have safe drinking water. And that was the first issue we wanted to make sure is that our drinking water was safe. I know it's, it's important for you, but it's certainly important for, uh, for not only from Danville, but uh, everybody uh, east of us uh, down the Dan River. So she, uh, she uh, emphasized that uh, what they were doing as far as uh, drinking water uh, in making sure that those tests will be in, uh, done. David Paler, who is Director of Department of Environmental Quality, uh, we talked, uh, he gave us a, uh, an update. Uh, one of the things they're doing and one of the things that uh, we uh, had a concern of is again uh, that uh, we're going to have people that are coming uh, from outside of the area to, uh, to enjoy the uh, Dan River and uh, even all the way down to Bugs Island Lake about fishing, boating, etc. And we, the question is, are the fish safe to eat? Uh, is the uh, water safe to uh, go in, and et cetera? And the answer was, we don't know. So the issue that uh, David Paler with the Department of Environmental Quality uh, made is that uh, this uh, ash will float uh, you know, down the river, and then it uh, basically settles to the bottom of the river. And it could sit there for years. And it will be brought up uh, when we have a flood. And as you, if you lived here your whole life like I have, you notice that uh, the, uh, those floods will uh, pick the, uh, you know, come up, uh, could pick this material up, and when it gets outside the banks, what happens, uh, the question I asked David Paler is what happens when it floods and this material gets out of the croplands, what it does it do to the crops, but also what it does, does it do to the grasslands as far as the beef cattle and also the dairy cattle. What happens to the beef, what happens to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the milk? And they don't know that answer. So I suggested that uh, they uh, had a, a conference call last week, and I think one of the things we'll learn from David Paler, who will be here in Danville tonight, is that uh, you know five years ago the uh, Tennessee uh, had a a lot larger spill than we had uh, you know that we had here. But uh, what lessons learned in Tennessee that we can be bring uh, back here so that uh, we can uh, you know get those uh, make sure that we have safe drinking water, but also uh, uh, on down the line. The next thing is we talked to the uh, Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. What is it going to do to the, uh, to the fish uh, again uh, in the uh, uh, streams? What is it going to do to the wildlife who drink this, uh, you know, the deer, the squirrels, et cetera, et cetera? You know, if they drink this and then a hunter, uh, you know, happens to harvest one of these, what happens when you eat that? Uh, so all of those questions are, are, you know, asked, but we certainly don't have an uh, answer right now. 
John Allback, who is director of uh, Office of Drinking Water, the first meeting we had uh, was on a Monday morning at 9 o'clock, and as soon as he got through with, uh, with us in Richmond, he was headed to Danville, and so he uh, made the uh, emphasis that, uh, that Danville uh, was, uh, in, and we really need to thank uh, the, uh, the employees of the city of Danville, uh, an employee at uh, the water station uh, at, uh, uh, on the uh, west side of Danville saw this happening before Duke announced this. Uh, there is a, evidently a way that they can see what's coming in, and he noticed that the water had turned from the normal red to, uh, to gray. And so it, uh, the red flag went up, and he, uh, he, he rang the, uh, the bell, and so thankfully uh, that uh, our employees at the city of Danville are doing what they did, and, uh, and we saw this. Uh, so John, uh, with the Department of uh, Office of Drinking Water, assured us that uh, the state and also the locals uh, here in the city of Danville and downstream are doing what they need to do to make sure our drinking water is safe. And so if you see them, uh, thank them. But also I uh, have met uh, several times with John Daniels, who is the uh, Virginia uh, Attorney General's uh, environmental lawyer. And uh, one of the things that I have seen in the newspaper is that Duke says they're going to be responsible. Well, I uh, wanted to make sure that uh, Mr. Daniels uh, knew that, uh, uh, that uh, Duke not only had to be responsible for the cost as of today, and they're keeping up with all the costs on the state level and a local level, and those will be charged back uh, to Duke. But what happens when that flood doesn't happen for 10 years? And that flood uh, then floats out and uh, you know, messes up those croplands and messes up the, uh, you know, the, uh, for the uh, cattle, et cetera. Who's going to pay for that cost? So we got to make sure that we hold uh, Duke not only uh, responsible for today's cost, but also for down the stream. So again, the, uh, the meeting uh, again is today at 5:30 at Chamber Council. So I would encourage you uh, to be there, and then go to YouTube and look at the I think a, a pretty well uh, piece uh, on uh, uh, on the Dan River. <laughs> this session was a little unusual. Uh, you know, normally we have about uh, 3,500 bills and resolutions. Uh, we had a lot less uh, this year, uh, probably, uh, you know, close to uh, less than 3,000 that uh, we actually had uh, to uh, go uh, before us. But one of the, uh, you know, people uh, all the time are coming to me and asking me to put a bill in, and one of the uh, uh, bills were about recycling. There is a company that's just located uh, not too far from here, Owen Illinois that makes uh, beer bottles for Linda and for John uh, and you. <laughs> so, uh, so one of the things that they do is that about 50% of the bottles that they make out there come from recycled. And, uh, and it helps them is because those bottles don't go back into the landfill. The uh, bottles uh, can reduce their uh, material cost. And so what we have done is uh, we have put in a resolution for the Manufacturers Development Commission that I am one of the uh, founding members of that. And we're gonna look at manufacturing about how we can recycle products uh, and put that, uh, take it out of the uh, stream going into a landfill and put it back uh, into a, a system that uh, can uh, use those uh, into a manufacturing. And so I think it's really a win-win. It's a win for the localities is because it's less material going to the landfill, so the landfills uh, don't get uh, full as quick. It's a win for the manufacturers because it can uh, lower their uh, material cost, but it's also a win uh, for the state of Virginia because it is, uh, you know, it's the best place to do business and it just shows the other manufacturers Factors, uh, what we're doing uh, in, uh, in Virginia to uh, help uh, to uh, bring forward uh, lower our costs. So we had some other bills that uh, you know was before us. I think Les will uh, kind of uh, tell you about some of the uh, high points. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to uh, see people from home to uh, come to Richmond. It is a hectic, hectic schedule down there. So I would encourage you that uh, you know if we're in Richmond, please come see us. If you have any issues that on the state level, please give us a call and thank you. We certainly do appreciate that update. Thank you so much, Delegate Marshall. And our last speaker is Delegate Les Adams. Les Adams was elected to serve in the Virginia House of Delegates in 2013. This is his first General Assembly session. Les represents the 16th District, which includes part of the city of Martinsville and part of Henry and Pennsylvania counties. Let's give Les Adams a warm welcome. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, having me here. Uh, this has been my first session, as Linda said. 
course, and I want all of you to know, especially those of you in the 16th District, what a privilege it is to be your representative and to be up there representing the folks from back home. Um, this has been uh, a, a good learning experience for me, uh, and I try to recognize that as a freshman. There is a lot to learn, uh, but uh, I feel like we made some accomplishments as well. Uh, first of all, it is good to be back home, too, uh, as was mentioned you know, uh, by Senator Stanley, you know, we're a part-time legislature, so we come back, I've come back to my law firm and as a member of this chamber, uh, back into uh, our own economy here. And uh, personally, I'd like to thank all of you who have expressed the well wishes to me as my wife and I are now enjoying uh, our two-month-old <laughs> at home. Uh, he, uh, our second son was born the second week of session so it was uh, uh, quite an exciting time for our family, and, um, uh, and uh, yeah, timing is everything. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, the speaker assigned me to the standing committees for Science and Technology and the Courts of Justice Committee. Uh, the Courts of Justice Committee, uh, as you may know, hears nearly a third of all the bills that are presented in the General Assembly. I also served as a part of that committee on the Criminal Law Subcommittee, uh, which by far hears more bills than any other subcommittee in the General Assembly. And so there were a lot of late nights, uh, multiple times a week, uh, and uh, on occasion kept me from coming home uh, on the weekend. But uh, something that Don Merricks told me that I thought was really wise advice and prepared me going into that particular committee was that it's not only important what you pass in the General Assembly, but it's likewise maybe more important how much you kill. Uh, because we, you, you would be astonished at some of the ideas that are brought before the Courts of Justice Committee that do not reflect the values of South South Virginia. And uh, you know, I, 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 I was pleased to be on, the, on a majority uh, side of that committee, and, uh, and I think we did a lot of good work there. Um, I've also worked with members of the House and Senate uh, for issues that are of common concern to all of us with uh, joining the Business Development Caucus and the Rural Caucus is led by Senator Ruff. And I was fortunate to be in a minority from the freshman class to actually have multiple pieces of legislation that I uh, was the chief patron on actually pass both the House and the Senate. One of those that I'm particularly proud of is a joint house resolution directing the Commission on Youth to study federal, state, and local funding as it relates to special education needs. Uh, this idea came from a conversation I had with folks from the Hatcher Center and uh, we recognized some of the things that I had observed when I was a prosecutor. Uh, there are certain incentives and uh, we have an obligation to make sure that students are not unnecessarily segregated and Medicaid funding is a big part of that study, and so it relates not only to our local needs here, uh, but to needs across the state in terms of special education, uh, uh, um, teaching and uh, provisions that are made, but also to the larger debate on Medicaid expansion. Um, the Bannister River, we extended the Scenic River designation throughout all of Pennsylvania County, so uh, we anticipate some tourism benefits from that. One of the major points that people would talk to me about when I campaigned for this office was the standards of learning when it came to school legislation. And I am pleased to tell you, and I was a co-patron, as I believe Danny was, on significant legislation that initiated in the House of Delegates to reform the standards of learning. This will limit the amount of assessments uh, that our elementary and middle school students uh, currently undergo, and it also creates a mechanism by which there will be more local input and more frequent evaluation so that the assessments accurately reflect what we need to learn, what we want our children to learn. There's also the Virginia Virtual School uh, that created uh, a specific agency, executive branch agency of the government that uh, will be available to all students in the Commonwealth. And this uh, fits with what I know all of us are concerned about in terms of providing more uh, flexibility and options for parents. Uh, and I think it'll be a particular use in our region. So 
those were some of the highlights. And of course, there's the Medicaid expansion issue that has hovered over all of the General Assembly this session. Um, when I ran for office and I was reflecting, it was about this time last year when I was first approached to run for this seat. And uh, one of the first things I did after I decided to run was to study this issue. And so I made it very clear where I stand. Uh, I'm opposed to expanding Medicaid under Obamacare. But if you are in favor of it, there are arguments to make. And there's an appropriate way to debate the issue. But what I'm concerned about, and I know my colleagues are concerned about, is what's happening now when the governor is insisting that Medicaid be expanded and that provisions be made as part of the budget process with the threat that the rest of government will be shut down if it doesn't make it into the budget. I don't think that's right, and I doubt many of you think that's right. Uh, it's helpful to remember how we came to this point. The Affordable Care Act was passed four years ago, and I doubt there's anyone in here who's had a positive experience with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, it's been a real plague on the country. I mean, in my own personal law firm, we've seen you know, our policy for our employees increase. Uh, there's been increased unemployment across the country. And of course, the president continues to delay different provisions within the Affordable Care Act as people uh, raise concerns to, uh, to, to somehow stave off the political impact of the full force of the legislation. Well, a part of the Affordable Care Act was a mandate on the states to expand Medicaid. In June of 2012, the United States Supreme Court eliminated that requirement as an unconstitutional provision and a violation of states' rights. And so now it's up to the individual states to decide whether they wish to expand under the act or not. And so far, 25 states, mainly on the West Coast and the Northeast, have chosen to expand Medicaid. North Carolina is not even considering this. And in Virginia, no legislation has passed to make it so. Now, certainly that's a possibility. If a majority of the people's representatives believe that Medicaid expansion is the way for Virginia to go, then legislation could pass. That's the appropriate way for policy to become law, correct? So that didn't happen. And yet we're having these strong arm tactics imposed upon us to expand even when there's no legislation to do so. Now, Regardless of your position on the issue, I think we should all agree that when we go back to Richmond, and, uh, and, and I know my colleagues here feel the same way, we should decouple these issues. There should not be uh, a consideration of either expand or not get a budget through. Uh, the bottom lines, as I understand, between the House proposal and the Senate proposal is 99.9% .9 in agreement. So hopefully that's where we'll end up when we go back. But in the meantime, I am happy to be back here, and I'm um, looking forward to seeing all of you some more. And again, thank you for your support. Certainly appreciate those thoughtful comments as well, um, Delegate Adams.